This program, Words Like Freedom, Voices of Harlem, presented by Harlem Writers Guild, will feature authors John Robinson, Mark Polite, Angela Dews, Malik Kirkwood, Eartha W. Hicks, Robert Woodbine, Kay Bell, Judy Andrews, and Minette Coleman. June 19th, 3.15 p.m. Learn more about how to purchase these books at schomburgcenterlitfest.org slash Harlem Writers Guild. Hello. We are so happy to have you join us at the Schaumburg Center Literary Festival. I am Diane Richards, the Executive Director of the Harlem Writers Guild. The Schaumburg has been an incredible partner and supporter of our organization since Dr. John Hendrick Clark, one of our founders, met with Artorio Schaumburg to discover his African-American past in the mid-1920s. Today, our program of literary excellence will feature some of our up and coming writers, Harlem's own spoken word artists, and our collaboration with Jermaine Dupree and Remy Martin on Voices from Harlem, a celebration of the Harlem Renaissance writers in spoken word and music. We hope you enjoy and thank you for joining us. Next, we are proud to present Remy Martin, Jermaine Dupree, and the Harlem Writers Guild in a co collaboration entitled Voices from Harlem. My name is Diane Richards. I'm the executive director of the Harlem Writers Guild. It was founded in 1950. It stands for Black Literary Legacy of Excellence. The Harlem Writers Guild teamed up with Remy Martin and Jermaine Dupree to celebrate the Harlem Renaissance. Poetry is definitely a culture of excellence. Today we pay homage to the Harlem Renaissance by taking poems from back then and giving them to the voices of modern Harlem. What up, fellas? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? I created a unique track inspired by each of the poems and then teamed up with spoken word artists to bring these poems back to life. It was important to cast young spoken artists from Harlem to tell the poems of their elders because we wanted to capture an extraordinary historical time in the art form in which young people know, identify with, and can build on. In black history, you hear about the struggle, but you never really hear about the happiness. This is something that should definitely be celebrated. It was music, it was visual arts, it was social and political great minds. Voices from Harlem is our opportunity as the Harlem Writers Guild to reach through to the younger generations. Poetry allows you to express yourself at the highest level. It is able to take you to a place where you have never been before. That's how powerful poetry and music together can be. It can contain political content as well. It can contain viewpoints that might not make it to a newspaper. We need projects like this in order to tell the other side of the story. Because when you look at it, not all of us have power, but we all have a voice. We all need to be more poetic. The world needs to be more poetic. Good afternoon. My name is John Robinson, and this piece is entitled Father and Son in These Harlem Streets. While walking down the block, my son once asked, Dad, why are you so hard on me? So as we stopped on the corner and I took a swig of water, I said, son, I'm hard on you because the world won't be soft. It will chew you up in various ways and spit you out on the pavement like sunflower seeds on hot summer days. It will smoke you like cheap loose cigarettes from the bodega and not think twice about how much it burns your fingers. I'm hard on you because I see so much in you. It's like watching a comic book character hero come to life and the hero doesn't realize how powerful he is yet. He's learning to use his powers so his footsteps are soft and his heart is pliable. He's as strong as hurricanes and his will is undeniable in his mission to be great at many things as he can grasp until he understands that he is just another man. So son, 
I'm not hard on you. I'm not hard on you because I hate you. I'm this way because from C to signing C, I do this because when I look into your eyes as we walk these Harlem streets, I see the best for you and in you because you are the best of me. And I just can't wait for you to see how great you're going to be so that you can finally see what I've always seen. Thank you. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps because you finds it kind of hard. Don't you fall now. Because I'm still going, honey. I'm still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Polite, and I will be reading from the Binge Watcher's Guide to Black Mirror. Black Mirror has been influential and eerily predictive as well. Whether it be a, a, the abuses of big data, a political scandal, or invasions of privacy, this anthology series stretches far and wide when it comes to what it assesses as the postmodern human condition. Constantly, unabashedly, it goes to dark places, using our social relations to show us who we truly are. Despite the instant contact that we often have with one another, Black Mirror highlights the ironic disconnection that comes along with it. And that says nothing for how predictive it is. Some episodes in their content predicted an election and what tech would emerge later in the decade of the 2010. This series has been prescient and made a number of spot on calls as to how we will be living in the not so distant future. The angst that comes that some of us feel about the potential applications of technology are oftentimes justified as we see over five seasons. We live in an age of digital media where information is available instantaneously and Black Mirror captures these potential unforeseen consequences of new tech so accurately that it has become shorthand for how wrong things can go. There is a concept in social science called the law of unintended consequences. While not as ironclad as natural law, this concept does have some usage in pointing out what can happen that wasn't necessarily foreseeable. Let's look at one current real world example for a moment just to get an idea of the notion. In online news, the bigger, more established outlets can put limitations on the availability of their content. If you visit a site, you may be allowed to view no more than 10 articles freely within a month's time. Your information access is restricted behind what is known as a paywall, the mechanism that the publisher is using to fund their publication and maintain a revenue stream. If you do not subscribe to the news site, you won't be able to see any additional content. Paying for access to the site of a news publication can be cost prohibitive for many people. Because of this, what is left are sites that aren't behind a paywall. But these may not be as trustworthy or rigorous in vetting information as established sources. Unfortunately, these sites and those like them can proliferate and we are often amplified on social media. It is a case in point that typifies the old adage about a lie traveling around the world and the truth hasn't even stepped out of the house yet. Instead of being a safeguard for the funding of credible journalism, the paywall is one of many things that fuels the proliferation of disinformation. The stated intention was to promote the funding of news 
But the resulting paradox is that many more sources are questionable. Just something to think about when your phone, the next phone notification goes off with breaking news. If current technology has an unintended consequences, then they will definitely exist in newer innovations. I'm folding up my little dreams within my heart tonight. I'm praying I may soon forget the torture of their sight. Yeah, for time's deft fingers scroll my brow with fell, relentless art. I'm folding up my little dreams tonight within my heart. Hi, I'm Angela Dews, and I'm going to read from Harlem, Hit and Run, a murder mystery set in 1990. I was up most of the night at the precinct. I walked the detectives through the replay. I gave them positions, and we acted out the parts. The acting gave me some welcome distance from the deed, and it moved the energy into the storytelling in my mind and away from my heart. Obsidian came back to tell me they found a caddy abandoned under the viaduct by the river. He asked me, how does it feel to be in danger, to witness someone dying? Did you feel tenderness towards your fellow man and fellow woman? Was your heart open? I got the point he was making, using the language from my meditation with his, at his precinct. No, I said, I noticed my heart had closed. I disassociated to protect myself. But that morning in front of the bank, my heart did open. I had marched across 125th Street, away from the bank and Obsidian, because I felt a need to reestablish a safe, a safe distance between him and me. When I turned back, I got a wider view of the two lines leading to the bank's covered windows and doors, stretching and turning at opposite corners, up both Adam Clayton Powell and Frederick Douglass Boulevards. And I felt the incredible tenderness I was talking about and that I practiced for. My people, glorious and complex, I remember once Langston Hughes said, they don't know how beautiful it is to be colored. Pearl, Pearl, Samantha was waving a piece of paper at me as she made her way across the street. She's one of those slow moving sisters. You got another fax from Roger, she said, when she finally got to me. She passed me a single page rolled lengthwise like a baton. Thank you, Samantha. Sure, she said. As she turned away, she added, the devil is busy, but she didn't wait for a reply. I unrolled the paper. It was a poem. I folded it in half. Who's Roger? Obsidian asked from behind me. He had done that thing he does. Sneaking up on a person is probably an essential talent for his cop job. I turned to him and told half a truth. Roger is my friend who teaches, teaches kickboxing and mixed martial arts to my meditators. I wish the brother well, he said, but you're going to be spending a lot of time in the city, and I don't think you can be trusted. I deserve that, but I didn't expect it. If I'm going to be here, I need to keep meditating with your people, I said. That was hard last night. You, you watched someone get shot. Did you feel the danger? Did you feel the chemicals in your body unleash? Yes, if you're talking about fear and grief, I felt all of it. So my people experience that all the time. And their intention is to protect themselves from a danger they perceive will leave them dead in the street. Huh. Perception is framing reality, I said, figuring out how we think things are. You say your police perceive danger in the dark bodies they're supposed to protect. Do you hear yourself? I'm not afraid. This is my community. But we can't afford empathy in an open heart. You saw how fast things happen. You saw last night. You won't have to worry about meditating at the precinct again. It's not going to happen. Wait a minute. This is how it works. This morning, I sat with the direct experience of being activated and being aware of where the reaction was landing in my body. I could tolerate it barely because I practiced. And I stayed present in my thoughts and feelings and watched them change. It's like being on a desert and seeing an oasis in the distance and the possibility of release from a terrible thirst. Then getting there and taking the water to my lips, that one moment of tasting freedom. Yeah, I practiced too, he said. I discharged by moving my body this morning. But we can't just dis discharge the grief and rage. To heal, we have to admit to what's happening, to the fact that the community and the cops are all being triggered again and again without release. Them and us, he said, 
that's a place we never step out from. Sometimes the mist overhangs my path and blackened clouds about me cling, but oh, I have a magic way to turn the gloom to cheerful day, I softly sing. And when the way grows darker still, shadowed by sorrow, somber wings with glad defiance in my throat, I pierce the darkness with a note and sing and sing. I brood not over a broken path. No dread, whatever time may bring, no nights are dark, no days are long When in my heart there swells a song and I, I can sing My name is Malik Kirkwood and I'll be reading from my book titled This Fragmented Stream of Consciousness Terrain traversed from various ends of this land, our great migration. It is here, it all intersected. The continuation, I don't fully process. I see your pride and I begin to understand. What did you know? This village, the inner workings of current past times, forged out of sacrifice, a bond that could never be broken. You serve as its glue. You had to know. The artwork, the dance, the essence, the culture, she's been passed down. She's here today. A people purpose through perseverance. God speaks through you. You gather us before him on this holiday. Our mother's present, our father's present, our children curious, our heads are bowed. Dear Heavenly Father, you know our every need. I pray that you look on every situation known and unknown. Let your will be done in our life. We thank you for friends, family, and enemies. Give us a sense of gratitude for the unknown and for guidance and patience. We ask that your will be done and we will forever be grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We all say amen and form a line. I fill my plate to the edges and pull up a seat at the table. Close friends, my yams and mac and cheese embrace each other. I look to every seat and see I. We will be sent on our respective journeys, sent off one day to navigate and find our way. You've been preparing us. I reflect and see everything so vividly. My eyes water, images of our former selves. Living rooms serve as stages, backyards serve as fields. This place I call my home. Football fields lined with cars. I walk to my cousin and stand beside him. He lifts his hand, palm flat and upright. What you wanna run? I place my left hand behind his with my right finger. I draw up, cut right and up again. You got that? I ask him. Yeah, on go, go wide. He replies, drawing an imaginary line of scrimmage across the gray pavement. I line up just behind it, left foot in front, my right ready to explode at the sound of go. Set up, huh, huh. set go, and I'm off. My right foot pushes off the pavement. My right arm pumps furiously, three, five, seven yards out to my uncle's white truck. I cut hard to my right. I look back to my cousin over my right shoulder, raising my hand as he fakes. I imagine my opponent bite. I plant my right foot down, breaking over my left shoulder. I raise my hand high to the sky. I'm open. I watch him throw the ball as it spirals through the sky. My legs move as fast as they can to keep up with its trajectory. I see the laces as they rotate, the ball piercing the air above me. As I run, my momentum outpaces my stride. I trip and crash into the gravel. The ball smacks into your car. The alarm sounds through the city streets. I look down to check the damage. My knees scraped, flesh exposed as blood and dirt reintroduce themselves for the umpteenth time. You can't throw, man. I threw that ball perfect. You just slow. You always trying to blame somebody, he yells back. I was wide open. You're supposed to throw it in the pocket. How you throw it perfect if you hit the top of my granny car? Right on cue, you come out with your keys to turn off the alarm. I told y'all be careful around all these thoughts. Get a ball here, you all come inside. You speak in run-ons. I pick the ball up from in between the side of the car and the curb and smack my lips. See, now we can't play no more because of you. Shut up. You shut up before I, both of y'all stop all that arguing. Little Brandon, you get inside. You grab me by the arm and yank me in close. Your voice is stern. What did I tell you about threatening people? 
I told you about that. You're going to get yourself in trouble one day. Go on inside and sit in that back room until I come get you out. It's getting dark outside anyway. How come I'm the only one? Stop talking back to me before I call your dad out here. I breathe in fiercely through my nose and pull my arm from your grip. You mumble under your breath as you follow me through the screen door into the busy living room. I hear you clearly over the laughter inside. Always want to threaten somebody. That's going to come back to bite you. You keep on. I walk through the passing of people into the hallway and speak to no one. With my head down, I cut through the crowd like a hot knife through butter, blocking out the echoing sounds and voices. Ooh, you know you wrong coming in the house like that. Quit all that pouting. He know he wrong, just ignore him. I sent him to the back until he get over that attitude, acting like a little girl. He'll get over it. They keep laughing. They're laughing at me. The festivities continue in my absence. I make my way into the room, my lips pinched tightly. My hands are balled up into fists. I close the door behind me and plop my face down onto the bed. I bury my face into the pillow. No one comes to speak with me. And so I lay here in the back room with the lights off until the voices and laughter and joy from the front room fade out. This is not water running here, these thick rebellious streams that hurdle flesh and bone past fear down alleyways of dreams. This is a wine that must flow on, not caring how or where. So it has ways to flow upon when song is in the air. So it can woo an artful flute with loose elastic lips. Its measurements of joy compute with blithe, ecstatic hips. Hello, my name is Ertha Watts Hicks and I will be reading from Love Changes. Can we switch mothers? Dawn told her about the keys, huh? Lamel laughed. <laughs> I know he thought I was stupid for telling her. Dawn's mouth was bigger than her behind, but with all my girlfriends out of state and me with no long distance carrier, who else would I call about girl stuff? Mommy, I suck my teeth. Are you a psychic friend? Nah, save my advice. My advice is free. Next time, save yourself the trouble. Tell your mom from the get-go like I suggested. Whose side are you on, chocolate? When it comes to you and your family, I blow the whistle and wear the stripes. Now hold on. I have someone else near the line. The phone line clicked twice, but the call switched back to me. My Mel's voice had turned to syrup. Yeah, Cosmo, like I was saying, I feel real bad, I really do, because you and I have a lot of fun together. But I've got to be honest, we don't have much in common, so I guess. I cut my mouth off doing my best to imitate his voice, but sounding more like Cookie Monster. It's best that we just be friends. I got a chuckle out of him, so I kept it up. The last thing I want to do is waste your time. I'd still like us to hang out once in a while if that's okay with you. I closed by saying, and the Oscar goes too. Lamel's voice was just above a whisper, but it had bass. That combination could lull me right to sleep or wake me up from it. Even though I didn't sound a bit like him, I knew I had the script down cold because he was still laughing when he said, hm, 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 trust me, chocolate, if I ever gave you something stiff, bare naked and about that size, it won't be an Oscar. Now, knock it off. She won't buy it unless I'm composed. I never bought into any of his flirting. Ramel and I were just friends. Actually, Ramel was my closest friend, an investment banker, big and built, bald, brown, and dimpled, but he was a mess. Not only did he collect women like he did luxury timepieces, he remained unattached and had absolutely no time for sisters. He even had the nerve to have very specific taste. His type was blue-eyed with Big lips, hips, boobies, and black girl booty, courtesy of Stairmaster. My mail was back on the line with me sooner than I expected. Okay, what's the story? Do you want the whole story or the abbreviated version? The truth, chocolate. Don't add any plot twists or cliffhangers. Just tell me what happened. I know how you are. Well, first of all, mommy shows up here unannounced and uninvited. She doesn't even bother to say hello, right? She just pushes past me, grunting and complaining. Ah, 
You look tired. Mm, this place is disgusting. And I'm trying to be nice. I'm like, hi, mommy, you look great. Would you like something to drink? She ignores me walking all up through here like she owns the place, turning her nose up at everything. Okay, that's nothing new. Wait, let me finish. It gets better. She snatches Tebow from me and starts yelling. He looks horrible. What kind of mother are you? You ain't doing nothing for his rash. And then she starts calling Spider all kinds of broke bums while she's holding my baby. So I try to take him to put him in the room and mommy is snatching him from me and we are having a tug of war with my baby. Tebow screaming at the top of his lungs. Finally, I pry him from her vice grip, take him back in the room and calm him down. When I come back, mommy starts shaking me like I'm a two-year-old, pointing to the mirror saying, mm, look at you, you're busted. Ain't no man ever gonna marry you. I don't know why I wasted my money on your education. You ain't nothing but a fool. And then she hauls off and slaps me. Whoa, time out. Ramel whistled, chocolate, come on now, that's foul. What, you think I'm lying? I know you're lying. I'm just trying to find a nugget of truth in this gold mine of yours. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Andrews. I'll be reading from my latest book, The Gathering of Gemstones, a poetry collection. The title, Cargo. No other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929 to 1968. What thoughts are conjured in a human mind to steal culture, precious riches, kidnap, traffic, breed another human being, store inside a ship as shipment, as cargo, goods, property, trade, to be inspected, Hands all over mouths, sacred breasts, genitals, wombs that cover a heart in pain. Hands traveling into soft sections that are private, circling around forbidden places. Brown bodies invaded, bartered, prodded, whipped as three-fifths a human, like an animal from continent to continent for 400 years, creating new nations, a workforce, an economy for profit? What thoughts are conjured in a human mind to beat religion, doctrine, prayers into a stolen brown body for profit? What thoughts are conjured in a human mind to rip a stolen brown body from his, her, family's arms and not allow either one to read, write, beg, weep, learn for profit? What thoughts are conjured in a human mind to slap, curse, insult, humiliate, torture, spit, maim, scar, wound, tie up to a tree, hang, torch, stab, cut, run, run over, step on, tar, and feather at a party, picnic, in a forest, barren land, watch, laugh, Curse, insult, clap, joke, burn, bury alive, invite children to a party, a picnic, to watch, eating movie theater popcorn, stomp, separate limbs, using an animal or vehicle, divide, conquer, using hateful words, deeds, confusion, separation by complexion, hair, texture, eye color, home, shelter, poverty, class, starvation, injustice, inequality. Our children do it now to each other. 
they stomp hatred into the faces of their brothers and sisters on street corners owned by gangs, engulfed in crack, cocaine, heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, meperidine, trafficking, stolen brown bodies, kidnapped in America, murdered for profit? Ignorant thoughts are conjured in a human mind today to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Forget about slavery. That happened a long time ago, that crap. Stop being so lazy. 400 years of history is now a part of technology for the human mind to profit and traffic and watch. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Robert J. Woodbine and I'm reading from Sun Chasers. One day about 10 months after Daniel had joined New Heaven, one of his fellow gang members brought back a 16 year old boy who had run away from Czechoslovakia about six months before. The boy's name was Adam and he was hungry and looked very sloppy. He was so skinny that just looking at him, you felt sorry for him. All the New Heaven members welcomed him. In a week or so, Adam was trained to be a beggar because he was so young and had a cute face that could earn sympathy easily. He also got along with everyone since he was simple and pure. One Friday, Big Head was there for dinner and to listen to Rattlesnake's report. This same day, Adam had earned more money begging than he expected, nearly 185,000 lira. He was so happy that he took some of the money and bought a pair of shoes without it being approved by Big Head or Rattlesnake. During dinner, Rattlesnake noticed that Adam was wearing a new pair of shoes. Where did these new shoes come from? Did you steal them? No, sir, I bought them with my own money. What do you mean your own money? Isn't it the money you earned today begging? Yes, since I had earned extra today, I decided to buy a pair of shoes for myself. Don't you know the rules here? You are stealing the family's money. All of the money you earned belongs to the family. Without approval, you cannot use it. It's not fair. I earned all of this, Adam began to argue. Immediately, he was pulled away from the dining table. Rattlesnake took him to an isolated room near the back of the apartment. Big Head sat at the dining table quietly with a solemn face and watched this unfold. Several minutes later, very disturbing sounds came out of the room. It was a mixture of beating, crying, torture, and begging for forgiveness. The other family members were quiet and paid attention to what was happening in that room. About a half hour later, Rattlesnake came out and entered the dining area. This is just to give you guys an example. Do not betray the family. He looked at everyone with serious and sharp eyes. He then left with Big Head, who had not said one word throughout all of this. Later, when Adam came out of the room, nobody dared go to help him and show mercy. They all knew that it could be any one of them in the future that would suffer this cruel punishment. Barely able to walk and in obvious pain, Adam crawled to his sleeping area to lie down without dinner. There was blood at the rear of his pants and his face was swollen and red with blood trickling down his chin. He was still crying. Early in the morning at about two o'clock, one of the members, Romeo, woke up and went to the restroom. He nearly slipped and fell as he entered in the dark. When he turned on one of the lights, he discovered that his feet were covered in blood. In shock, he quickly woke everyone up. When all the lights were turned on, they saw that Adam had cut the artery on his wrist and bled out. He had been dead for at least half an hour. 
Romeo immediately ran up to the second floor to wake up Rattlesnake and report the incident. Rattlesnake quickly called Big Head for further instructions. This was an extremely serious problem and he could not make any decisions by himself about it. After he received Big Head's directive, Rattlesnake ordered two of the senior members to help him move Adam's body outside. Obviously, they didn't report this to the police. They couldn't since the family was conducting illegal businesses. Although New Heaven had policemen that they paid to look the other way when it came to prostitution, this was different. It was a suicide resulting from severe physical abuse and torture. About two hours later, they all came back. The restroom floor had been washed clean by two other members. Everyone was now quiet and no one dared speak about anything. A few days later, everyone in the family knew that Rattlesnake had placed the body on a bench in a public park about 10 miles away. When policemen found the dead body, they didn't know where he came from or who he was. All they knew was that he was another sun chaser from an Eastern European country looking for freedom. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kay Bell and I'll be reading from my book, Diary of an Intercessor. This poem is titled America and is dedicated to Langston Hughes. I think I may know a little about your dreams, deferred and damaged, turning themselves around and around like magic. Because like you, America was never America to me either. I have imagined what it would have been like if this land, which is supposedly yours and mine, and everyone else that looks like us, would have been a land of freedom or real democracy. And something besides just a little girl's imagination. Oh, what a world it would be. But I guess I have some of those basic dreams too. You know, the ones that spin around and around and kind of go nowhere. And even the ones that seem to play themselves out unexpectedly. And like you, I wonder, is there any land where we are all free from the emotional and physical entanglement of a dream deferred? Because I am too tangled and stretched and called ugly, but like you, I will not stop dreaming. You see, because we never dream in vain. And if we allowed America to defer our dreams, it would really make me wonder, who are we dreaming for anyway? We, the people, are the people who hold our own dreams. And they don't always have to be in our tears or sorrows. Minds are in my legs because I'm walking with victory. So they can call me ugly. Most of the time, they can't say it to my face. And even if they did, my America is the dream the dreamers dreamed. There's nothing ugly about that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Annette Coleman, and I'm reading from my novel, The Tree, A Journey to Freedom. The first ride to freedom was painful. They moved through the woods, bumping along and torturing Epsi in the belly of the wagon even though there was room for two lying side by side and slats that let in plenty of air, the quarters were so tight she couldn't change positions. Epsi had to remain completely still. Beneath the sage, she smelled hay, potatoes fresh from the dirt and horse, a strong smell of horse. Her head bounced with every clip clop he took, sometimes hitting the top only inches away from her face. After that, she kept her head to the side and cushioned what blows she could with her hands. Epsi couldn't tell how long they traveled, if they were still in the woods or on a dirt road, but she prayed they would reach their destination soon and without incident. Once there, if it appeared safe, she would tell the man about Luke, the small man she left in the tree. The wagon stopped and so did Epsi's heart. She held her breath as the driver spoke to someone. Because of all that covered her, she couldn't make out the words, but she heard the final 
Good day, clearly, and envisioned the white man driving the wagon, tipping his hat as he drove off. She is held slowly as they moved on. When the wagon stopped again, Epsi braced herself for the next problem. Voices, lots of voices could be heard above the hay and potatoes, but she could not understand a word. The wagon moved slowly, making a deep turn and another stop. Something sounded wooden and hard, then sounded strained and metal. We have to pull you out, so don't be afraid. Two pair of hands grabbed her by the ankles. She clutched her box. Then she saw some light. Once out, her nervous body relaxed, allowing her to stand. Her legs weren't as weak as she thought. If they were shaking, it was from fear. Welcome, friend. An older, bearded white man took her arm with genteel aplomb, escorting her from the wagon. They were in a large barn with bales of hay and bags of produce piled high. We are sorry for the delay as well as the rush to pull you from the sanctuary of the tree, but you have succeeded in making it to your first stop. My son got you here. Someone else soon with more expertise will conduct you further. As soon as he spoke, four men, two white and two colored, made quick business of removing most of the sacks from the wagon. They removed the wooden board that had been above her head. One man hid it in plain sight on the wall between two animal stalls. No wonder there had been the extra pungent odor of horse. The men filled the wagon with more hay and produce. The younger white man took the reins to leave. The older man was still holding her arm. No white man had ever treated her like a lady. Come, he said when it was obvious the doors might open. We must get you to a place of safety so no one sees you. Garrett will be your escort. He has done this many times. Yes, sir. Epsi tried to offer a smile. Is this Ohio? Dark-skinned Garrett and the bearded white man laughed. Goodness, no. We are in New Garden, friend. Ohio is miles away, but we will not rest until you reach it. Garrett went to a stall and patted a horse on his thigh. The large beast moved to one side as if trained. Garrett reached down and pulled up a latch. A door in the straw opened, revealing crudely carved steps. Garrett went down first, then reached back with his hand. Hope you ain't afraid of the dark, ma'am. He called her ma'am, polite as the gent white gentleman. No, I ain't. I've been traveling mostly at night to get here. A few more days of darkness will bring you to the light, miss, the old man replied with a gracious smile. I have one thing to ask you, sir. There is a man that was in the tree with me, a man called Luke. The old man frowned. He's always there. The door of the barn opened and Garrett pulled her down quickly to the tunnel. As she adjusted her eyes and Garrett held her arm, she asked, did I say something wrong about Luke? No, ma'am, you didn't, Garrett whispered. See, Luke ain't never leaving that tree cause Luke and that tree is one. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Harlem Writers Guild is a forum where African-American writers develop our craft. This community of writers is the space where we honor the rich heritage of writers who have gone before us while we nurture the talent of contemporary voices. On behalf of our executive director, Diane Richards, we thank the writers we have heard from today. John Robinson, Mark Polite, Angela Dews, Malik Kirkwood, Eartha Watts Hicks, Dr. Robert J. Woodbine, Kay Bell, Judy Andrews, and Minette Coleman. We would also like to thank the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture for their longtime support of the Harlem Writers Guild. Books by all of our authors can be found on the festival website at the Schomburg Center, litfest.org slash Harlem Writers Guild. We thank our writers for sharing their gifts with us. We also thank our collaborators, Remy Martin. Remy Martin has clearly demonstrated their strong commitment to making sure that Harlem's voices continue to be heard. We thank Remy Martin for being consistent and authentic as they embrace the work 
of the Harlem Writers Guild. Would you like more information about the Harlem Writers Guild? You may contact us on our website at harlemwritersguild.org. That's harlemwritersguild.org. My name is Sylvia White, and on behalf of the Harlem Writers Guild, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Schomburg Center Literary Festival. Hi, my name is Kelly Starling Lyons, and I am the author of the Ties Travel series, published by the I Can Read imprint of Harper Collins Books and illustrated by Nina Mata. I am thrilled to have this opportunity to share our series with you. Thank you to the Schomburg Literary Festival and to all of you for joining us. The Ties Travel series is a tribute to Black Boy Joy the power of imagination, and the strength of the Black family. So it's my pleasure to share book two, Zip Zoom, with you today. In this story, Ty is learning how to ride his scooter, but he's pretending it's a race car. So let's see what happens. I'm Ty. I have a scooter. I can't wait to ride it. We go to the park. Daddy and Corey bike. Mama takes me to scoot. I put on my knee pads. Kids zoom by like race cars. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I want to zoom too. I see the flag waving. I step on my scooter. I kick off. I see crowds watching. What's that sound that cars make? Vroom. Yep. Wobble, wobble. I do not zip. I do not zoom. Keep going, Ty, Mama says. I think about stopping, but I do not give up. I see the flag waving. I step on with one foot. I kick off with the other. Cars roar by me. I focus on the track. Vroom. Wobble, wobble. I do not zip. I do not zoom. Almost, Mama says, I do not give up. Daddy and Corey ride over. You got this, Corey says. You can do it, Daddy says. Mama gives me thumbs up. I see the flag waving. I step on with one foot. I push off with the other. My family cheers. My heart pounds. I step on the gas. Vroom, vroom, boom. Uh-oh, what happened? What do you guys think? Are you okay, Mama asks? I sniff and wipe my eyes. I am on the ground. That's it. I give. Want some help? A girl stops her scooter. She smiles. Watch me, she says. The girl steps on her scooter with one foot. She pushes off with the other. Hold on, she says. I see the flag waving. Look at her go. The girl zooms back to me. My name is Ari, she says. I'm Ty, I say. Ready to try, Ari asks. We step on with one foot. We push off with the other. We hold on. I see the flag waving. Ari zips. I zoom. We're racing side by side. Cameras flash. Crowds clap. I didn't give up. And what's that car sound? Vroom, vroom, vroom. And that is Ty's Travels zip. Zoom. Thank you so much for sharing this story with me. As I shared it with you, Ty is all about imagination. Let's see if you can use your imagination. Let's say that we're looking at a picture and it has Ty and it has the ocean behind him. 
where would you imagine that Thai is? Hmm. Maybe you could be at a beach. Yeah. You could be at an island somewhere. If you were an artist like Nina Mata, the artist for this book, what other things would you draw to let us know exactly where Thai is? Maybe you would draw some palm trees if we're talking about something tropical. Or maybe you would draw some seashells or a sandcastle or a kite flying in the sky or people surfing in the water. Maybe some seagulls flying overhead. All of those special details that you add, that's what brings stories to life. So use your imagination. Put Thai someplace new and think about how can you take your reader there with you? What if Ty was standing with a roller coaster behind him? Where would he be then? Oh, did you say an amusement park? Yeah, that's possible. Or the fair or the carnival? I love all those ideas. What kind of details could we add if we were writing or if we were drawing to let people know exactly where Ty is. Yeah, we might add a merry-go-round or maybe we could add some stand selling food like cotton candy and popcorn and pretzels or turkey legs. Maybe we could add that we see people in long lines and people cheering or smiling. So when we write, when we create, it's all about using your imagination, just like Ty, and celebrating moments that are important to you. So thank you so much for joining me, and thank you to the Schomburg Literary Festival.